Okay, everybody, welcome back. We are in our section, well, I might call it our, our second section of notes um, for Chapter 5 in Volcanoes for Natural Disasters. And so we just got done talking about all the examples of the various volcano types. We had five types, stratovolcanoes, lava domes, shield volcanoes, cinder cones, and continental calderas. Now we're going to talk about some of the places that are at risk from uh, volcanoes. Most places that are at risk from volcanoes, and we've mentioned this already, are around the Pacific Ocean. That is the Ring of Fire. Um, this is the same, the same Ring of Fire that contains most of the earthquakes that, that happen in the world. Um, but yes, surrounding the Pacific Ocean, uh, many, many, many volcanoes. Also, of course, you've got Hawaii, which is a hot spot. It's not at a plate boundary. But it's in the middle of a plate and just happens to be over, over a, a particularly um, hot area in the mantle, which burns through and causes the islands to pop up that we call Hawaii. Uh, Yellowstone also is a hot spot. Now, we have called that a, a continental caldera. Um, that's kind of the manifesta manifestation of that hot spot. But there is a particularly hot area of the mantle under that part of our continent as well. That's under um, the state of Wyoming. Of course, at, uh, at mid-ocean ridges, and the one place in the Mid-Ocean Ridge where it actually pops up to the surface and becomes an island is Iceland. And we've talked about Iceland and, and the various uh, difficult-to-pronounce volcanoes that are there. And also, um, I'll mention this more in class, East Africa. You may have heard in African Asian studies about the East African Rift Zone and how the one part of Africa, let's see if I can sketch Africa right here, all right? There's Africa. And there's one part of Africa, I think, that has the horn on it is actually starting to rip off from um, the rest of Africa. And there's a whole series of long, elongated lakes in here that are evidence that it's actually um, the two sides of Africa are tearing apart. It still looks joined right now, but it is progressively pulling apart that we call the East Africa Rift Zone. So these are areas that are all directly um, related to, are directly at risk of volcanoes. But then of course, any area that is in the path of a, an ash cloud of a pyroclastic flow certainly would um, experience risk too. So it could be at risk of some sort of effect of a volcano. If you look at our west coast right here, um, this area you probably uh, recall as being the area that we call the Cascade Range. All right, and why is that? Well, that's because the Pacific Plate is sinking beneath the North American Plate right here. All right and sending up large plumes of, of lava that pop up and, and result in volcanoes, like uh, Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is, is right, uh, there's a lot of red right there, but it's right about there. <laughs> Let's see if I can change the cursor. Here we go, try that. Right about there is Mount St. Helens, and um, Mount, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Crater Lake that we looked at, which is called there, is right about there, and there's a whole series of other volcanoes right along that chain right there, all caused by um, the subduction of the Pacific Plate. But all these areas um, uh, experience some degree of volcanic hazard. All right, so what are the effects of volcanoes? Well, in um, the United States, we don't uh, get as many volcanoes as other places during the year, but most of the ones that we do get are in Alaska. Now, thankfully, Alaska is a very large area, and it's pretty sparsely populated. Um, but uh, there are places around the world that are highly populated that have gotten... Um, that have gotten volcanoes uh, and really have affected a lot of people. Uh, Japan, Mount Unzen, Mount Unzen. It was in Japan, and we talked about that. How Maurice and Katya Kraft were these volcano photographers, and they were they were killed. Um, Mexico has a series of volcanoes. In fact, one is called. You're gonna love this one. P O P O C A T E P E T L. Popocatepetl is the name of it, and I visited that um, several years back, and uh, we call it Popo for short, for obvious reasons. Um, in the Philippines, another highly populated area, Mount Pinatubo is there, and Mount Merapi is a, a volcano that was recently active in Indonesia. So all these, these places um, are at risk of the, effect, the effects of volcanoes. What kind of effects do we get? Well, everybody knows volcanoes to spew out lava, and we're going to talk about a couple different kinds of lava later on, but also ash. The pyroclastic flows, these big clouds of volcanic ash. And again, don't think campfire ash. Think almost like a gritty sand type of ash. So it's stuff that you really do not want to be breathing in. Lateral blasts. Well, what that means is instead of 
So here's a volcano right here, okay? And instead of shooting upwards, some volcanoes shoot out sideways and can affect a much larger area because um, it's actually moving across the land instead of going up and, and, and scattering into the atmosphere. So lateral blasts means... Well, like in football, when you lateral something, you throw it sideways. You, throw, you lateral the ball, you throw it sideways. Um, finally, volcanic gases. Um, sulfur dioxide is one that is uh, it's, it, it's very poisonous, and um, you don't want to breathe too much of it. Now, secondary effects are, are things that happen as a result of volcanoes, but aren't actually from the volcanoes themselves. For example, debris flows and mud flows and, and avalanches and stuff. Well, the avalanche is something that falls down from the mountain, and mud flows involve some sort of water. So ask yourself, okay, where would all the water come from that would cause some sort of a mud flow? Well, that would be snow on top of the mountain. And volcanoes release a lot of heat. Heat melts the snow, and so you have these secondary effects, which are not the volcano erupting themselves, but other risks um, like landslides and mud flows coming down the mountain. Of course, we know all about tsunamis and how um, erupting volcanoes and earthquakes can cause tsunamis as well. And one bigger effect that we don't really think of too much is the fact that there's even been instances of global cooling. Uh, back in the early 1800s, there was a volcano that spewed so much ash into the air, and all these, all these little teeny tiny ash bits were in the atmosphere that they actually made the atmosphere cooler. And in fact, they called it the year without a summer because it was not warm in that summer at all. So you can have a short um, time of global cooling as well. So here's a few of the examples of those. We mentioned Mount Vesuvius, or as the Italians call it, Vesuvio. That was what destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, we uh, saw a video on Krakatoa, or Krakatoa. Sometimes people call it, um, call it that. Mount St. Helens was one big one that affected the United States. It killed almost 60 people. Um, and this was pretty recently. And in fact, if you want to look up somebody who is kind of interesting, look up... Harry True oh two R's, sorry. Harry Truman. Spelled just like the president, but not the president. Um, this guy was alive in 1980, or at least up until 1980. He was a um, kind of an old curmudgeon who lived at the base of the mountain with a lodge and um, was one of the victims of the volcano, but he was an interesting character, and they interviewed him several times leading up to the eruption. If you want an interesting interview, um, Look up Harry Truman. But he was at uh, Mount St. Helens as well as uh, almost 60, 60 others. Mount Unzen, we mentioned, was the one that killed Maurice and Katya Kraft in 1991. And that is a lava dome. It's not um, uh, one of the other types of volcanoes. The type that Mount Unzen is is a lava dome. Mount Punatubo affected a large amount of the Philippines in 1991 because of ash clouds. Um, 1995, a small island called Montserrat was actually um, many people, many rich people, I think, lived there. And then they had, a, uh, I think, a relief effort for Montserrat featuring all kinds of famous um, musicians and artists and celebrities and that kind of thing. But a lot of homes were destroyed in Montserrat. I mentioned Mount Merapi in Indonesia. And, of course, there's Eya, Eya Fialukul, I'll just pronounce it like that, in, in Iceland in 2010. So a lot of volcanic activity in recent years, but also in um, uh, many centuries ago as well. So here's where most of our volcanoes occur every year. This is off of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. All right, so this is the northwestern United States right here. And all these islands are because you've got one oceanic plate sinking beneath the other plate right here. And so this, is, this line indicates a plate boundary. So these volcanoes pop up, and we have the Aleutian Islands. Of course, there's the Cascades in the northeast, northwestern United States as well. And Hawaii is not associated with any plate boundary, but it's at a hot spot. A hot spot under the Pacific Plate. All right, so what comes out of volcanoes? Well, most people are familiar with lava. And lava is simply molten rock. And we mentioned the three different kinds of rock that contribute to volcanoes. We've got basaltic rock, which is, um, which is very, very dark. In fact, I'll draw a chunk of basaltic rock right here. Okay. Very, very dark and uh, not very much silica in it. So when it, when it flows, it's very, very runny. That's why it's the most abundant one, because it flows out of volcanoes very, very easily. Of course, 
rhyolite, and this is the same thing as granite. Okay, and you're probably familiar with pink granite. It's mostly light in color, maybe with some dark specks. Okay, mostly light, and a lot of that lightness comes from the fact that there's a lot of silica, high silica. S-I-L-I-C-A, high silica content. And remember, silica makes lava sticky like sugar. All right, and andesite, well, I'll just draw this as being like half light, half dark. It's not really striped. Okay, but it's, got, it's a mixture of rhyolite and basalt. It's a mixture of continental rock and, and oceanic rock. And so we see a lot of these at the Andes Mountains, and that's where, that's on the west coast of South America, where the continent meets the ocean. So all these can form types of lava, but the most abundant type is basaltic because basaltic is the, runny, is the runniest, and we see it the most easily. All right, They can run fast enough to possibly catch up with you um, lava flows. Depends on how steep the hill is. I mean, 30 miles per hour, I don't think I can run that fast. But usually, if the hill is pretty steep, once you're out on a relatively flat area, it slows down um, quite a bit, and you don't need to worry about it chasing you down the street. All right? Again, again that's because the, uh, basaltic lava is very runny. Now, I'm going to tell you about two different types of basaltic lava, one of which is called, I'm going to pronounce that, it looks like pahoho, but remember this is Hawaiian or maybe I didn't mention it before, but it is a Hawaiian uh, name. So it's more like this. Pa, ho, a, ho, a. So that O and the E are pronounced separately. Ho, a, ho, a. Um, and it winds up sounding like pahoe, hoe when people say it fast, but pahoe, hoe is, um, is very ropey lava. Uh, I'll show you this on the next slide, but this is very, very runny, and think of it like tomato soup. If you ever had tomato soup and you, and you let that get, um, tomato soup gets, gets cold, or if it cools down, it films like a skin on top and it gets kind of wrinkly. That's what pahoe hoe lava does. It flows very smoothly, but when it kind of starts to cool, it gets wrinkles on top, and it almost looks like rope, uh, like coils of rope. The second one right here, it looks like two A's, it's pronounced ah. Uh, Ah, it's also a Hawaiian word that, and a lot of times you'll see it with a, a little um, apostrophe right there. You pronounce that ah ah in Hawaiian. That means that it's really kind of blocky and chunky, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. Um, some people say that uh, um, ah ah lava was, got the name because of the sound that you make when you walk over it when it's cooled. Now, of course, if you walk over hot lava, it's going to hurt, but this is so pointy and blocky and chunky that even if you walk over cool ah-ah uh, uh, lava in your bare feet, it's so jagged that it makes you say ah-ah-ah uh, uh, as you walk over it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the name of it. You've got ah-ah uh, uh, lava and pohoehoe lava, and I'll show you that in just a second. So this is pohoehoe at the top right here. See the edges of it? As it starts to cool, it gets kind of like a wrinkly... Um, Consistency. Some people say that looks like ropes sometimes. And so this is pohoehoe. O E H O E lava. This stuff down at the bottom is called ah ah lava. And take a look at it. All right, it looks pretty blocky and chunky. Now, obviously, it's glowing. Let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit. There we are. It's obviously glowing, so it's obviously hot. But, um, when that cools, you probably don't want to be walking over this very much because it's very, very jagged. All right, this right here, this pahoehoe lava, oops, look at that. Well, it's burning somebody's house down, of course, but after it cooled, you could probably walk over that with no problem because it's very, very smooth. Sometimes the, the, the wrinkly parts get, make little, um, like I said, little wrinkles, but it's not jagged at all. So... Both of those have very different consistencies, but they both flow slowly enough that you don't need to worry about it chasing you down the street. Sometimes lava will also create what are called lava tubes. All right, and Lava tubes are areas underground that lava has flowed and no longer has, that is, has run out. So sometimes you can even walk in lava tubes once they've become kind of extinct or dormant. So I would not walk in this lava tube right here, seeing as how it has active lava in it, 
this guy, I think, is taking his life into his hands, walking over there. But uh, I'm assuming he's knowing what he's, he knows what he's doing. But this right here, oops, this right here is a lava tube that uh, lava flowed through it at one time, but it no longer is. And so you can walk through it. You can actually see at the very bottom right here how it looks like the lava kind of ran out and like left sort of a flat area on the bottom of the tube. All right, but at one time, both of these areas were very, very um, full of lava flowing through. So you can see lava tubes, and you can go to Hawaii and walk through lava tubes today. All right. Well, the opposite of, not the opposite, but one of the very different types of volcanic activity than lava is what we call pyroclastic activity. Now, pyro means fire. And clastic means fragments, okay? So it literally means fire fragments. All these very, very hot cinders and ash pieces and blocks and chunks of things that are spit out of a volcano. This stuff doesn't flow out. It gets kind of spit out in all kind of, in millions or billions or trillions of little teeny tiny bits. And we see that as, as, a, as a cloud. So all of this stuff together is known as tephra, T-E-P-H-R-A. But it has all the different pieces, has, they have different sizes, and so they, they're given different names. It can be called ash, all right, stuff that's sand-sized or smaller. Sometimes it's called lapilli if it's a little bit bigger. Sometimes they're called blocks or even bombs. What kind of bombs are actually kind of cool? These are blobs of, of magma that are shot out in the air, and as they spin through the air, they kind of they kind of swirl around through the air, kind of like a football. And by the time they land, they have like these football, kind of like these spiral stripes on it. So they spin through the air as they fly through, and, um, and as they spin around, they get these kind of swirls. And many times, they actually cool in the air because of flying through, that by the time they land, they don't splatter. They just land like little footballs. And so you can see all kinds of footballs around volcanoes. Those are called volcanic bombs. All right. So all, this, all these different things are... Um, what we call pyroclastic um, fragments. All right, so it can settle lightly like snow, or if they're bigger pieces, they can really rain down on you like rocks. So you really want to be careful. That's like fragments. So this right here is a kind of a drawing of a pyroclastic cloud, um, and you really don't want to be in the way of this thing right here. We saw a couple of videos um, in class of a pyroclastic flow moving down the mountain, and these can move very, very rapidly. If you're living somewhere over here and some of this pyroclastic ash falls on you, yeah, it might kind of, you know, ruin your yard or cover your house or car with, with ash, but it's a little more lightly falling right here. If you're in the way of this pyroclastic flow, you're probably going to get killed because of the very fast, hot-moving gases. So this is just light-moving ash um, further up here. Speaking of ash, what does it do? All right, well, remember, the ash is not like campfire wood ash, but it's like little pieces of sand almost. It's literally little pieces of rock that are so teeny tiny that they kind of can fall lightly. Um, you can have several feet of ash cover thousands of square kilometers, and so um, this is a real problem because the question is, what do you do with all this stuff? All right, it's not like snow that eventually melts. You actually have to physically carry it away somewhere. Um, vegetation absolutely kills uh, vegetation. It, it destroys the surface water uh, reservoirs. It can actually cause, I mean, this stuff is pretty heavy, so it can cause structural damage. It can cause your roof to cave in, very much like um, snow can. Um, people can have health problems, difficulty breathing, and even jets can, if the stuff gets sucked into the engine, um, can flame out and cause the, the turbine engines to stop working, and um, your jet will go down really, really quick. So activity is ash you do not want to mess with. This right here looks like a neighborhood that has pretty much been destroyed by volcanic ash. And this didn't flow down over it horizontally. No, it fell down from above. All right, all this stuff kind of fell down over time and really piled up. Not sure if this neighborhood is... All right, so pyroclastic flows are one type of this ash that comes down the mountain. They can move really, really fast. 250 nearly supersonic speeds coming down the mountain. 
Um, and they mentioned in, in the one video that if you were to be hit with one of these, probably a number of things would kill you. The, the, the sheer speed of the gases, the heat of them, but also the fact that you're breathing these gases in and it would just incinerate your lungs immediately. You do not want to mess with the pyroclastic flow. Um, we'll mention one or two uh, scientists in, in class, um, geologists, who were, were killed by pyroclastic flows. Um, so uh, these can just absolutely wipe out any populated areas in the path. It just, whether it's populated or not, trees, forests, huge trees like Mount St. Helens we'll look at. There were huge trees around Mount St. Helens that were just knocked down like matchsticks, all because of this pyro pyroclastic flow um, that came out. And one thing about Mount St. Helens was that it was a lateral blast. And so it literally, so say here's a mountain right here, okay, the eruption moved out that way, and all this pyroclastic flow moved horizontally, which a lot of the stuff on this side of the mountain <clears throat> was absolutely destroyed. A lot of stuff on this side of the mountain was pretty much okay. Um, but that was caused by um, a lava dome actually collapsing on Mount St. Helens, and um, that was caused by an earthquake. So there was a number of um, events that can cause... Um, uh, that can cause these eruptions to actually start. Plastic flows. So here's one right here. So if you're so this stuff higher up is probably going to get blown over some distance and then fall elsewhere. This right here coming down the mountain is a pyroclastic flow. Now remember, this stuff gets shot up straight into the air, and then the lighter stuff kind of gets carried away. But then, the, either that way or that way. But then the heavier stuff starts to fall down and really, really rush down the side of the mountain. And that's what we're seeing right here, this pyroclastic flow. So it shoots up and then comes right back down and rushes down the side and pretty much destroys anything. All right, the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum were killed by a pyroclastic flow. Now remember, these aren't actual people right here, but they're the casts of people as they died. They were covered completely with volcanic ash. And, uh, and so they chipped the ash away, and they broke into these cavities right here. They filled them with plaster and chipped around the plaster, and we can see basically the shapes of the people who were in this event right here. Um, so what kind of gases are kicked out of a volcano um, when it erupts? Well, carbon dioxide is one of them. That's a big one. Um, global warming is, we say, is caused by too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we know that a lot of volcanoes do kick out a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, but we think humans are even more responsible for that. But most of the carbon dioxide that happens naturally in the atmosphere is caused by volcanoes. But also there's a lot of water vapor too. Water vapor is a good thing. We need it. Um, but a lot of these other gases um, are bad for us. Now, carbon dioxide isn't really bad for us in that it's poisonous, but if you breathe in carbon dioxide and don't breathe in oxygen, you will suffocate. It doesn't, um, again, it doesn't necessarily poison you, but if you breathe it in at the expense of oxygen, you're not going to be breathing for much longer. But then, of course, there's sulfur dioxide as well. All right, and you know sulfur to be um, a yellowish rock that people say smells like rotten eggs. Um, uh, this can mix with, with rain in the atmosphere and produce acid rain, uh, which can be very damaging to plants and also um, civilization and structures, too. Hydrogen sulfide is another one, and carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide actually is poisonous to you. That's what comes out of the tailpipe of cars, so um, you want to stay away from that. But all of these uh, are gases that are, are potentially dangerous uh, to people and plants. Um, like I said, acid rain can destroy plants and make soil unusable. And um, VOG, you've heard of smog before, that's like smoke and fog. VOG, I remember hearing about VOG warnings when I was in Hawaii. Um, that's, that's kind of shorthand for volcanic smog. All right, so a lot of the stuff that comes out of the volcanoes mixes with some fog, and they call it VOG. And they even give you a, vo a VOG index. That is, oh, it's a high VOG index today. It's, um, I don't know, it's a five on the scale of six or something like that. So that's something that they monitor frequently around the volcano. All right, so what, kind of, what are some uh, secondary events that occur from volcanoes? Well, debris flows, mud flows, mudslides, all these are, are secondary events because the volcano doesn't cause them themselves, but it's when you have volcanic stuff mixing with water, like snow on top of the mountain, that stuff starts to rush down. 
All right? Even if the interruption doesn't happen, a lot of times the heat from just the volcanic activity can cause enough snow and water to melt, um, just, well, to melt into, into water that you can have this stuff rush down the mountain. All right? Debris, debris fro the flows and mud flows are kind of all the same thing, just stuff that is mixed in with water. And when it stops, concrete. Um, mud flows, again, very much like debris flows, but just a little bit finer, but involve lots of water. Oop, it looks like a Z, lots, L-O-T-S, of water. Okay, but even landslides as well. There was a huge landslide that, that um, occurred on Mount St. Helens. So let me see if I can draw Mount St. Helens again. And, all right, that's it from the side right there. And it had this big lump in the side of it, this big bulge right here. And that's what they were monitoring when it erupted. Well, a volcano, oh, I'm sorry, an, erupt, a, uh, an earthquake, I'm sorry, uh, took place that actually kicked off this. And this whole lump slid down the volcano. That's supposed to be an arrowhead right there. There's a giant landslide that sl slid down to the bottom of the volcano, which weakened this area here, which allowed it to explode out in a big horizontal flow right there. But that landslide, caused by an earthquake, um, was just moving rock. And there's no water involved, just moving rock, moving downhill under the uh, influence. All right, so here's a mud flow that uh, affected a, a populated area. All right, lots of water, but you can see all the stuff that was left behind is very, um, very thick stuff. Not, you're not likely to dig out of it very All right. Um, Mount Rainier is a little bit southeast of the, the city of Seattle. Seattle is right up here, and that's in Washington State. And this is a, ha this is a hazard map for Mount Rainier. Now, just to give you kind of a um, point of reference, down here somewhere, just off the map, a little bit further, is Mount St. Helens. All right, so Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens are basically like neighbors and um, it's the same kind of volcano. So this is a hazard map for all the different kinds of things that could happen around Mount St. Helens. Um, green indicates pyroclastic flows, all right? Uh, lahars are basically like um, debris flows, all right? In fact, I'll write that L-A-H-A-R. I think I mentioned it, or it was mentioned on the one slide, but it's just like a mud flow, all right? That's when water mixes with volcanic ash, and you have almost like, it's almost like concrete, like, a, like an ashy mud flow moving down the mountain. Those lahars are indicated by, um, by orange and lighter orange and, and yellow right here. So this is a hazard map for Mount Rainier, which is a battle. All right. So let's just look at a, an actual modern-day example right here and apply it to the Eya volcano that we're going to call Eya, call it Eya for short, that is in Iceland right here. Um, in fact, uh, is this Eya? It says Eya, but um, I'm sorry, this slide is a little bit messed up. Eya was not 1980. Eya was 2010. May 18, 1980 was Mount St. Helens. All right, so sorry about that header up there. I think the header got a little bit, oops, sorry. Um, the header got a little bit messed up. So May 18th, 1980 was Mount St. Helens. All right, yeah, this is not Eyjafjallajökull. This is Mount St. Helens, uh, May 18th, 1980. And it's very typical of a Cascade volcano. And remember, there's a lot of Cascade volcanoes, and a lot of people live near Cascade volcanoes in our Pacific Northwest. All right, from Mount St. Helens, we learned uh, uh, great volcanoes. All right, this is what it looked like beforehand. Remember I mentioned there was a lump this big bulge right here, that wasn't natural, well, it wasn't natural, but the mountain wasn't originally shaped like that, but that bulge was pressure building up inside the mountain. And so when, it, when the landslide caused that bulge to slide down, that weakened part of the, amount of the mountain just exploded outwards horizontally. That's Mount St. Helens, and this is called Spirit Lake. Oops, P-I-I-T. Spirit Lake right here, and if you looked up Harry Truman, um, the old guy I mentioned before, uh, you would find that he had a lodge right on Spirit Lake, and that could even be his lodge right there. 
but they're a very beautiful, pristine area. And in fact, uh, no wonder people would want to live near there, but uh, it didn't. This is how it looks looks today. Um, again, huge, huge pine trees up in the Pacific Northwest just knocked completely down, and a lot of these were actually thrown into Spirit Lake uh, itself. So certainly not as spirited as it once looked. And you can see that about a third of the volcano's top is completely missing. All this got shot out horizontally towards Spirit Lake and towards the people that lived in that area right there. So Mount St. Mount St. Helens is uh, looks very... All right. Well, once again, I need to apologize for the header right here. The header is wrong. This is not about Aya, but it's about Mount St. Helens. Okay. Mount St. Helens. Right there. So it was dormant or sleeping. That's what that means. Dormant means sleeping, not dead, but sleeping for about 120 years. It was active in, back in the 1800s, um, but many people kind of forgot about it, and it um, and people started to to build around it a little bit. But in uh, in March of 1980, you had some seismic activity, which really got the attention of USGS geologists, and they started monitoring it um, for the next couple months. And so, in the beginning of May. 1980, that bulge that I told you really begins to grow um, at about five feet per day. And that's really significant when you talk about geologic terms. So they knew that pressure was building inside of that volcano right there. I mentioned before how there was an earthquake. Um, could have been related to what was going on underground or a completely different earthquake. I'm not entirely sure, but there was an earthquake in the area that caused that bulge to slide down. And so when that bulge slid down, it weakened that part of the volcano right there, and so it erupted out laterally or horizontally. That's what that means. Horizontally. At a rate of um, about 300 miles per hour. All right, that's, uh, that's very, very fast, and um, there was uh, actually in the way of that and, and were killed by it. Um, this blast extended out horizontally, but also shot upwards as well. So here's a volcano outwards and up. Okay, and so this cloud, this part of the cloud, er erupted up and kind of got pulled into the stratosphere. Now the stratosphere is a part of the atmosphere. All right, so there, this erupted out horizontally, but it went up and got pulled into the atmosphere and pulled into the, the jet stream, which I know we haven't mentioned much in this class, but it's a kind of a river of air that gets that moves around the world. And so this ash was pulled across the United States pretty quickly. And it started to fall on parts of western Washington state, um, the state of Montana, Idaho, and um, really started to block out the sun. In fact, many people said it basically turned to nighttime um, because this ash was so thick. Middle of the day, it turned to nighttime. Also, mud flow started to move down um, the side of the slope of Mount St. Helens. Um, so an ash mixing with water, all right, turns into a mud flow or a lahar, and they started to move down, um, down the Mount St. Helens. Here's kind of a, a close-up view of what happened. All right, so that bulge right there as it slid down, kind of crooked right there, as it slid down, this area was weakened, so the, um, the pyroclastic material could shoot out. All right, so this is, I keep doing that, sorry. This is that bulge right there. And this guy in the picture, I believe, um, is by the name of David Johnston, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N. And he was um, observing this volcano kind of on standby um, to, to measure the, um, how much the bulge was, was increasing day by day. Well, he was right in front of it when it went, and that was not a good place to be because if you're standing that close to it, he was roughly right about there. Um, he and about almost, oops, I meant to erase that, almost 60 other people were, were killed in this lateral blast. So you see two parts of it here. You see one part going out that way and one part shooting up right there. So that is Mount St. Helens. Um, so this giant, giant ash cloud just absolutely destroyed everything that was in front of it. 
um, but also shot ash far up into the atmosphere as well. So these were taken from about 10 miles away. So you kind of get the sense of scale right here. Um, it looks like it's right in front of you, but 10 miles away is still, um, uh, it seems like you're right on top of it. All right, so it erupted outwards, and so this red area, where are we here? Um, this red area was where most of the pyroclastic flow and, and ash um, knocked down trees and, and polluted that Spirit Lake. Um, you'll notice a lot of it on the south side wasn't too terribly affected. Yeah, there were some um, ashy flows right here, but most of it was in the direction the volcano erupted. But look at where the ash cloud drifted. I mean, across the United States, dropping ash all across the Midwest, even to Pennsylvania right there. All right, so uh, this kind of S-shaped thing is, um, again, you may have heard on the, uh, on the news about the jet stream. The jet stream tends to weave north and south, and that's probably what pulled that ash to the country um, right there. So this is Mount St. Helens after the eruption. Very, very barren looking. You, you saw the before pictures. It was very green. Here it's very barren. And if you look closely, you can see sort of into the side of that crater. You'll see that the crater is open on this side here, but it's kind of like a, kind of like a hood or a collar around that side. So it erupted out that way, all right, leaving this side of the volcano pretty untouched. All right, so that's the summit crater right there. And um, the Tuttle River, all right, well, it isn't, it's flowing very well right now, but this is where a lot of the ash and mud flows um, flow down from Mount St. Helens, the Tuttle River. And we're almost at the end of this section right here. So, in summary, what happened at Mount St. Helens? Well, about 60 people, almost 60 people were killed, one of whom was Harry Truman, T-R-U-M-A-N. Google or do, some, do a YouTube um, a search for, for Harry Truman. You'll find a pretty colorful character. You'll also see David Johnston. D-V-I-D. There's a T in there. J-O-A-N-S-T-O-N. Like I said, he was a geologist who was right in front of it when it erupted. And so there's an um, observatory now named after him in his honor because he was killed by that blast. Um, about a billion dollars worth of damage. So that was in 1980 dollars. So uh, by today, it would be a much more than one billion dollars. And it actually has been re um, active since then. There's been a lava dome forming inside that crater floor. And as we look at it in class, we're going to see in the middle of that crater another dome forming, very much like um, in Crater Lake. We have Wizard Island popping up out of the middle. There's another crater, another dome forming in the middle of Mount St. Helens crater as well. So these things aren't just once and done events, but they continue to occur. They continue to happen. So um, Mount St. Helens is a really, really good of, um, of the kinds of things that can happen in volcanoes. So here's that, that kind of collar-shaped crater, and in the middle of it, even in the snow, you can see that it's kicking off heat because snow isn't staying on it and it's sending out gases, and that dome is rising. So Mount St. Helens could be um, ready to, uh, to erupt in future years as well. So that's going to be it for this section. Thank you for uh, listening and watching, everybody. And we're going to finish out the last bit of the notes um, as a lecture in class. So uh, again, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you in class.